In this video, I'm going to be focusing on Article 2 of the Constitution. Um, one of the things that I failed to mention when I introduced Article 1 is that the Constitution, the way it's organized, um, Article 1 deals with the legislative branch, Article 2 deals with the executive branch, and Article 3 deals with the judicial branch. The order in which these articles were included in the Constitution and the organization was not an accident. Article 1 was written first because for many, for the framers of the Constitution, they anticipated the legislative branch being the center of the political universe. That's where national decisions were going to be discussed, debated, bills drafted, compromises reached, and then uh, eventually laws passed. And that's where the center of the political universe was supposed to be. Over time, as we'll talk about later on, that shifted to the presidency. Now, our, in our political system, uh, the presidency occupies sort of the center of the political universe. And we'll talk about why that changed and uh, over the course of these lectures. But for now, I just want you to know that Article 1, the legislative branch, Article 2, the executive branch, Article 3, the judicial branch, reflected the importance that the framers placed on each of these institutions. So let's begin. In the Constitution, the original version, right, the, uh, the Constitution envisions, and this is still the case now, a singular executive. If you recall, the Virginia plan anticipated a plural executive where there was more than one person that essentially made up the executive. It was a, a group of people. The framers wanted the national government and the president to be a stronger figure to help address some of the challenges that the country was facing. Um, and so they decided to have a singular executive. The term of office in the Constitution is four years. Presidents run for four years and then they can run for re-election. Also, originally, there was no limitation on the number of times that a president could run for office. Interestingly, after President Washington, um, our first president, served for, uh, for one term, and then he served for a second term, and after that, he decided he was going to step down and let other people become president. He felt that two terms was long enough for any one person. After, after President Washington, most presidents, almost all presidents, followed that same guideline of serving two terms and then stepping down. Not because it was written in the Constitution, it became a norm a behavior that everybody sort of recognizes, oh, that's how we do things. It wasn't until uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration that a president went beyond the two years, two terms, to three terms, and then actually ultimately four terms of office, that um, that norm was broken. Um, because the country was in the midst of a depression and the uh, Second World War, there was a feeling among people that the president, among President Roosevelt, that it, this was not a good time to change leadership. And so he ran for a third term and ultimately a fourth term. But by the fourth term, there are many people who argue that President Roosevelt was really not up to the job of being president. Some people argue that Eleanor Roosevelt, was in, his wife, was in many ways running the the exact the White House during that time. And so after Franklin Roosevelt passed away, um, the, the Constitution was amended. The 22nd Amendment was added to the Constitution. And now presidential terms are still four years, but presidents are limited to two terms. So that's a change from the, the original Constitution to what we have now. Now, the method by which we elect presidents is a source of confusion for many people, and I'll tell you, myself included sometimes. I mean, the Electoral College is a strange institution. So let me sort of backtrack a little. In all other elections that we have, the way it works is we vote, and then we add up all the votes, and the person with the most votes wins, right? That's the way elections are supposed to work. 
But for a variety of reasons, and I'm not going to get into the historical aspect, but you can ask questions about it if you want to on the discussion board. For a variety of reasons, the framers did not want to do that. They did not want to have a popular vote. That's what it would be called if, you, if everybody voted and you just counted up the votes and the person with the most votes wins. The framers were not comfortable with that arrangement, and so they came up with the Electoral College. The first thing you need to know is the Electoral College is not a college. There are no classes. There are no students. There are no professors. It's a different kind of college. I don't know why they use that term. I haven't studied the etymology behind that, but let me explain to you how this works. When we elect presidents, we don't we are not, it is not a direct election where voters vote for the candidates and the person with the most votes win. It's an indirect election. And so I'm going to start talking about it in this video, but probably won't be able to complete it all, and I'll pick it up on the next video. What we have during a presidential election is basically 51 individual elections because the states run the elections. So basically, we have elections, individual elections in, for president in 50 states, plus the District of Columbia. And so what happens is the voters in California select the winner in California. The voters in Wyoming select the winner in uh, Wyoming. In D.C., they select the winner there. But there's no point at which all the votes are tabulated. In California, for example, what happens is they count up all the votes. Whichever presidential candidate got a majority of, or actually a plurality, meaning more than anybody else, whichever presidential candidate got a plurality of votes, um, the winner of the election is awarded these electors. These are the members of the Electoral College. So we select the winner in California, right, because the person who gets elected um, gets all of California's electoral votes. Now, here I need to change the size, of the, or let me just move this over here. There we go. So, in 48 states plus the District of Columbia, they have a rule, it's called the winner-take-all rule. What that means is that if a presidential candidate gets one more vote than the next presidential candidate, they win all of that state's electors. In two states, Maine and Nebraska, they use something called a district plan. When we talk about elections later on, I'll explain the difference, what, what the district plan is. But for now, basically all you need to know is that in 48 states and the District of Columbia, if a presidential candidate gets one more vote than the next presidential candidate, they win all of the electoral votes. They win all of those electors. So it's not that the people don't have any say in who the president is. Um, it's just that it happens individually. So how many electoral votes does each state get? Well, it's actually pretty easy to calculate. The electoral votes per state equals the number of members of the House of Representatives plus the number of senators, which is always two. So for example, after the last census, so this might change um, after 2022, but back in, two, in 2020, um, around 2000, the 20, 2020 election, California had 53 members of the House. They had two senators, and so therefore they had 55 electoral votes. 53 plus two is 55 members of the House plus the number of senators. Well, what about, about Wyoming? Wyoming has a population of about 500 people. They have one member of the House of Representatives, and they have two senators. So how many electoral votes does Wyoming have? Right, they have three. One member of the House, two members of the Senate. Whoa, two members of the Senate. So they have three electoral votes. Now, the total number of electoral votes that if you add them all up, You've got 400, 435 members of the House, you have 100 members of the Senate, and then you have three electoral votes that were given to the District of Columbia. So there are a total of 538 electoral votes that are up for grabs in any presidential election. 
In order to win a presidential election, you have to get at least half that. So 270 or more electoral votes is what it's required to win the White House. Okay, 270 electoral votes. Now, in the next section, I'm going to talk about the method by which electors are chosen. Sorry for the delay there. I'm looking for the pause button.